Welcome back to Every Other Carl. I'm Carl, and today I'm going to start roofing my shed build. So there's going to be a lot of parts to this process. I'm going to be uh, installing a skylight on the other side, uh, the soffit, vents underneath, as well as doing the underlayment and shingling. So this will be an adventure. This video is going to be an overview of the roofing job. I'm not going to go into great detail on the skylight install or venting. I'll do more detailed videos on those later, since they're not something everyone has to deal with. However, venting a roof is something everyone needs to consider, especially if you're using a traditional wood sheathing and fiberglass insulation method like I am. Venting a roof will help manage the temperature inside your building, it'll help protect your roof sheathing from mold and rot, and it'll help increase the lifespan of your shingles. Venting the roof is not the same as venting the building. You're not necessarily taking air from inside the building and sending it out through the roof. Instead, you're taking air from outside the building, at or near the lowest point of the roof, allowing it to run up along your sheathing and then out, at or near the highest point of your roof. There are a bunch of ways to vent a roof. I'll give a more detailed explanation of how I'm venting this roof in a future video, since the full process will involve interior components like baffles and insulation that are not done yet. But for now, I'll let you know that I'm using soffit venting under the eave of the roof and a ridge vent at the top of the roof. Soffit is the horizontal material that runs under the eave of a roof. There are different materials you can buy for soffit, most typical being vinyl, but I'm making my own. With all the roof sheathing completed, I can start installing my soffit. All right, pretty much all the framing is done, all the wall sheathing and the roof sheathing is on. The next thing I wanna do is work on my soffit vents, so. That's gonna be uh, underneath this overhang, um, and I'm gonna cut vents in between each one of my uh, gable trusses so that that chamber has some air that'll go up to my ridge vent up top. And I found the most uh, cost-effective way for me to do that is make my own uh, vent. So I got this piece of cull, I have a few of these pieces of cull wood. This is pressure treated one inch by six inch board. And I am going to cut slots to go in between each one of those trusses. I cut the holes to fit between each of my rafters, then lined the whole piece of wood with silicone caulk and installed it with screws. There it is. Running all along the heave here. I'll close those holes up later with vents. I installed these vent covers once I had painted the soffit. These keep weather and bugs out. All right, now that I have that, I'm gonna put my first piece of rip edge on here just to make sure that it fits properly. Drip edge is an important first step in the roofing process. It keeps water that runs down the face of the roof from wrapping back up under the shingles and soaking into the roof sheathing. I'm not planning to install gutters, so this is also going to control where the water drips off of my roof eaves. You always add the eave drip edge first before your underlayment. The drip edge along the rake ends of your roof are added after the underlayment is down. You should nail high up on the drip edge so the nails will be covered by shingles and nail every eight to 12 inches. Okay, it's a new day and I have a few goals for today. One is to cut the rough opening and do the rough install of my skylight which is gonna be on the back side. And then ideally, I'm gonna to get to ice and water barrier. It's gonna run along the edges of the roof. And hopefully I get to the point where I can put the actual roof underlayment down. Um, I also have to cut the ridge vent at the top of the roof. First, I gotta take off this temporary plastic that I put on to keep the wood safe. Like I said earlier, I'm not gonna go into great detail about this skylight install. I'll do a detailed video about that next. However, you might have some other type of protrusion in your roof, like a vent or a chimney, and this is the stage that you would need to cut the sheathing and start the flashing process. My next step is cutting the ridge vent. All right, I'm gonna be cutting my ridge vent. It's gonna be two inches wide and run the 16 foot length of the building right along the ridge of the roof. I intentionally left any fasteners at least six inches down from the top of the roof sheathing. Um, once I cut this vent, I'll go ahead and add a few more fasteners in at the top of the sheathing. But uh, what I'm gonna do is just set up a chalk line. It's gonna be about an inch on either side of the ridge. 
set the saw to the exact uh, width of my roof sheathing and then cut right down that chalk line. There's a lot of tools online to help you decide how to vent your own roof. This works well for my barn style roof. All right, the ridge vent is cut. It's a nice clean two inch opening all the way down the length of the building. All right, all the soffit is in place with holes cut for each vent. The drip edges are in place on the bottom of the roof, front and back. Uh, I have the ridge vent cut and I have the skylight in the back installed roughly. Um, so the next step is to install the ice and water shield. So this is the product I'm using. It's a GAF StormGuard leak barrier that's gonna go along the edges of the roof. So let's get started. Ice and water barrier is adhesive, so I started by blowing off any debris on the roof so the ice and water barrier would adhere directly to the sheathing. Ice and water barrier protects the sheathing in case water gets underneath the shingles and the underlayment. This is especially important in the winter when ice dams can form and create a lot of damage. You put the eave barrier on first and then the barrier along the rake edges. All right, the ice and water shield is up around the edges of the roof. Next step is to install this underlayment. I'm going with uh, synthetic underlayment. This is the cheaper one that Everbuilt brand from Home Depot. So I'm gonna take this plastic off. Hopefully this is the last time I have to take the plastic off the roof. I installed the underlayment over the ice and water shield all the way to the edges of the roof. This isn't necessary. You can just overlap the top edge of the ice and water shield, but underlayment is sold in large rolls and I had plenty to spare. Underlayment catches any water that might find its way under your shingles and directs it down and off the roof. As with anything roofing related, you want to think of how water will travel and always prevent it from getting to your sheathing. You always start with the lowest layers first and then overlap them upwards until you get to the top of the roof, similar to how you would install shingles. This synthetic underlayment replaces felt paper, and it's better in many ways. It lasts longer, doesn't tear when you're walking on it, and it's more water resistant, which can be helpful if it rains before you get to shingle or if some shingles blow off in a storm. Unlike ice and water shield, underlayment is not waterproof. It's still slightly breathable, which allows any moisture from leaks or condensation that might find its way to the sheathing to evaporate. You don't staple this type of underlayment. Instead, it's highly recommended to use capped nails, which are way more durable and watertight. This is more time consuming, but well worth it. All right, all the underlayment is on. Um, if you noticed, it started from the bottom and then overlapped each layer as they went up over the top. This took one strip along the bottom, one in the middle, and then one right on along the ridge. And I will cut out the uh, ridge vent when it's time to shingle, but right now it's acting as a whole water barrier. Um, next thing for me to do is to install the drip edges along the uh, rake edges of the roof here on this side and the other side. The reason the rake end drip edge is installed over the underlayment is so that any wind driven rain that finds its way under the shingles will be directed onto the underlayment instead of the sheathing. Instead of cutting a piece for each pitch of the roof, I simply cut a slit in the face of the drip edge at each angle and just bent it over that corner. With the drip edge and underlayment done, it's time to start shingling. I'm using these GAF Pro Start starter strips and these GAF Timberline shingles. Starter strips go down first. They can either come in rolls or strips. Typically, the strips will be a different length than your shingles. If they're not, just make sure you install them so that the butt joints of the starter strips never match up with the butt joints of your shingles. They should be offset from the shingle butt joints by at least four inches. As with most roofing components, for water to shed properly, you want to start with the bottommost starter strips first, those along the eave edge, and then overlap the eave starter strip with the rake end starter strip. You don't have to overlap the starter strips up the rake ends though. You can simply butt joint them. Starter strip has adhesive on both sides and is nailed close to the edge of the roof. You nail it just above the tar line, which is about one and a half to three inches from the edge of the roof. That's way closer than you can nail a shingle to the edge of the roof. This is important as it holds the edges of your shingle down firmly in high winds. Starter strip also provides a nice clean line along the edges of your roof, which improves the overall aesthetics of your roofing job. It's also a final layer of protection at one of the most vulnerable points of the roof. As with shingles, it's important to leave a bit of an overhang over the edge of your roof. The starter strip and shingles should both overhang about a quarter to three quarters of an inch. 
Personally, I think a quarter to a half an inch is better to prevent the shingles from potentially drooping with heat in the future. With the starter strip down, I can start shingling. It's a good idea to snap some chalk lines to help you keep your shingles straight all the way across the roof. I didn't, but the shingles I'm using are pretty easy to keep straight since they're architectural shingles and my roof pitches are pretty short. You bring the shingles out to the edge of the starter strip and install the shingles from one end of the roof to the other. Then head back the opposite direction, making sure that the joints of your shingles never match the previous row. There are other ways to install shingles, but this is probably the easiest. As I said earlier, I won't give detailed instructions on flashing this skylight, but as soon as your shingles get up under a protrusion like this skylight or a chimney or something like that, it's time to start flashing. For this skylight, I'm using an adhesive flashing tape. I cut my underlayment a few inches away from all sides of the skylight so that the tape would adhere to both the sheathing and the underlayment. I started with the bottom and then went up the sides and top, making sure that water would shed from the tape out onto the shingles. Once the tape was down, I could use what's called step flashing, which is individual pieces of flashing that interlace with the shingles all the way up the skylight. If you want to see this full process, that'll be in the next build video. The back side of this roof was the most complicated because of the skylight. Once that was done, I simply repeated the process of starter strips and shingling all the way up the front to the top, making sure to stagger the joints. This is a barn style roof, which is somewhat unique, and there are a few ways to shingle the hips. I'll give an explanation of the method I used. I wanted to show you how I did the hip on my barn style roof here. Um, there's a few options. I could have installed a drip edge on this transition from the steep pitch to the shallower pitch and then ended my row of shingles, started a new one underneath that drip edge. What I did instead was put the majority of this row of shingles down along the side so that gravity is pulling them down. And that's gonna adhere nicely in the sun. And then right up above, I made the transition over and nailed along the top. And then this row above, I put it just to the edge, not overlapping too much, but just to the edge. This, this one would be tempted to blow with the wind. So I did one nail, one row of nails in the usual nail strip area up here, but I did a second row of nails a little bit closer to the edge, right along this area underneath here, obviously. The first row of nails is up here in the nail strip area, and then the second row is a little bit further down, closer to the edge, to give them a little bit more stability in high winds. With the shingling complete, it's time to cut out the ridge vent. By the way, I'm not entirely happy with the shingles on the left. As you can see, I didn't come up as high on that side as I did on the right, but it's still watertight and worked out fine. It just doesn't look perfect. With that cut, I placed a piece of starter strip and the first few of my ridge cap shingles. These are different than the regular shingles. I highly recommend using actual ridge cap shingles instead of cutting pieces of shingle. These are more flexible and they look a lot better. So for my first one, I'm gonna throw a piece of starter strip down, hold it nice and tight. <clears throat> With the first couple shingles in place, I can roll out my mesh roof vent. This type of vent material has been around for a long time. Some people don't like this rolled mesh. There are different options, including rigid plastic vents, but I'm using this for a few reasons. One, the ridge vents on my house were done with this type of mesh, and I want this outbuilding to match the house. Two, this type of ridge vent blends in with the roof much more than the rigid kind. Also, this is a less expensive option. This roll happened to be slightly damaged, and because I asked, they gave it to me for almost half price at Home Depot. If I were building a tiny house or a full-sized house, I'd be more inclined to use the rigid plastic vent style. But I don't have any plumbing in this building, so my humidity levels are relatively low, and I don't expect any issues. If you have experience with ridge vents, let me know your thoughts in the comments. They could be helpful for the next person to help them decide what they want to use. When you're installing cap shingles over ridge vent like this, you want to use longer roofing nails. The nails I'm using are two inches long versus the one and a half inch nails I used on the rest of the roof. It's also recommended to hand nail these instead of using a nail gun because you don't want to drive these nails all the way in. You want the mesh to stay spongy. 
and not get completely compressed. This is really important in order for this type of vent to work. Don't drive the nails all the way in. Now for the final one, again I have a piece of starter strip here, so that has adhesive underneath and on top. I'm going to go in the opposite direction. I'm going to cut this one just slightly shorter so that the adhesive strip shows on both sides. So, opposite direction. Nail that down nice. And then I'm going to take my last bridge cap. I'm going to cut the black part off. That's done. A little bit of hot sun, these are gonna fall right over nicely. With the roofing complete, I painted my gable overhang and freshened up the roof of my garden shed to make it match. I had enough shingles left over, so I just over shingled the garden shed. Very simple, easy job, just went over the existing shingles, and now everything looks nice and uniform. But that's going to do it for the roofing overview. Everything has been on here for weeks now and it has been performing great. Zero leaks. I haven't had to fix anything. In the next video, I'm going to show you a detailed explanation as to how I installed the skylight. Um, that's a pretty complicated process, so I wanted to give it its own video. Uh, if you want to see that, please subscribe. And this build is coming along great. There's a lot more content coming. So please subscribe. If you like the video, like the video. If you are a professional roofer, or maybe you see something that I could have done better, please leave it in the comments section below. That'll help somebody else out. But until next time, I'm Every Other Carl, and I'll see ya.